This YouTube pilot was told to go pick up some passengers at a remote airfield on the side of a mountain, and the flight did not turn out the way he thought it would. The pilot said it was a critical flight that ended in failure, and that's why we're going to look at what went wrong and the decisions he made. I'm Hoover, and welcome to your pilot debrief. If you don't know who this is, his name is Ryan, and he has a YouTube channel called Missionary Bush Pilot, where he shares footage of himself flying down in Papua New Guinea. This is a small country located just north of Australia, and it's a very challenging environment to fly in. There are a lot of mountains and jungles, and many of the airfields are just carved into the hillside. So when you combine that with bad weather, getting in and out of these airfields can be very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. When it comes to Ryan, here's what you need to know. He started flying when he was 19 years old, and he was a flight instructor for a short period of time before he was hired to fly as a missionary bush pilot in Papua New Guinea, which is where he's been for the last seven years. In total, he's logged about 3,400 hours, with 2,400 of those in the Kodiak aircraft that he's flying right now. To better understand what happened on this flight, we need to start by looking at the plan. Ryan's mission was to fly from Garoka Airport to pick up a few passengers at the Narambi Airfield located in a remote region of the country near the end of a long valley in the mountains, and here's how it all started. Morning, you guys. It's another cloudy one here in Garoka. You guys can see behind me. It's cloudy here. It's cloudy where I want to go out to Narambi. It's only a 22-minute flight out there. Just got off the phone with them. They said it's been raining like crazy. Not really a great way to start the day. And last week when I went in there when it was wet, it was very slick. I mean, so slippery. It took like two-thirds of the runway to really get down to a manageable speed. I had a little bit more weight. I'm going in empty today, so that's good. Fuel guy is coming now, so let's get fueled and I'll go over the weather with you and get out of here. I really like how right from the beginning, he's already thinking ahead about how all of that rain is gonna affect his landing performance. This is a grass strip runway, so the ground is gonna be soft, slippery, and maybe a little muddy, and that's just gonna make the mission more challenging. However, the bigger issue that Ryan has to worry about is the weather. Most of the airfields that Ryan operates out of don't have weather reporting capabilities. And that means one of the things that Ryan really has to rely on is observations from people texting him photos from the airfield. Check it out. I just got some pictures from the people that are out at Narambi right now. And it looks so wet. Let me show you. So this is the airstrip here. You guys can see it's like standing water ground fog all over the end of the runway that's looking out towards the approach where you'd be coming in. The reason why the weather is such a problem is because these airfields don't have instrument approaches and that means even if he's using the GPS in the aircraft there isn't any sort of procedure that he can use to descend through the weather in the mountains to get below the clouds. It's just a tough situation because he essentially has to act like a meteorologist and try to interpret what the weather is doing and I really like how he explains it here. All that blue that you see here usually just means a ton of clouds. So the biggest thing I'm considering is, is I can get out of here and I can get out there, but I wanna make sure that I can get back underneath the clouds and up the valley that I need to. So that's really the issue today is, do I take the low route the whole way out there and just have to work weather all the way down the valleys? Or do I just go up high and get out there and hope that I can find a hole to get back down? Should he fly high and hope he can find a way to get below the weather, or should he just stay low and try to pick his way through the valleys? Now, if he goes low, that could be more dangerous and he's gonna burn more fuel. Plus, he still might end up needing to climb through the weather at some point anyways. The other issue is that the weather can also change very rapidly. So if he goes low and he starts flying down a valley, but then he has to turn around, maybe the weather has collapsed behind him and now he's surrounded by clouds and he can't see any of the terrain to climb out. Unfortunately, to make matters worse, there's one more thing to consider for this flight. Oh, and on top of all that, it's Monday now. Four of my passengers have international flights out of Papua New Guinea on Wednesday. So there's just a lot of those type of things that are going through my head right now. Is it worth getting them today just to do the flight or wait for a better, safer day? Exactly. Is it worth it? I'm really glad that Ryan is talking about this because this is a very typical scenario where pilots feel pressured to make the flight happen, and it's a common factor in a lot of aviation mishaps. You might not be picking up passengers like Ryan, and maybe you're just trying to get home because you've got stuff to do and you don't want to get stuck somewhere for the night. You need to ask yourself, is it really worth it to try to do the flight? Considering all these different factors, I think Ryan did a really great job of analyzing the situation and he knew it wasn't worth the risk, so he ended up delaying the flight a day. 
Unfortunately, the weather the next morning was only a little bit better. And now there's even more pressure to get the passengers because they just lost a day. So let's see what happens next. I just got a text saying that it's all right. They sent me a couple pictures out there and it looks doable. Getting out of here is obviously not so awesome, but let's go ahead and get started. As he's starting up, I wanna show you the pictures he got in that text message because you can see how the weather looks a lot better compared to the images he got yesterday. That said, they've gotten more rain and the weather hasn't completely gone away. Ryan knows what the risk is and he's doing what he can to mitigate that risk and he made the decision to taxi out to the runway for takeoff. Pay attention to what Ryan does right before he takes off because this is something that pilots need to be thinking about every time they go fly. All right, we're gonna be 50 knots by our taxiway. Hello, we'll just stay on the runway, full reverse, heavy braking, going off, cut off, pull off, and shut off. After takeoff, we'll pitch for 85 knots, consider EPL, then we'll consider feathering it. And we will go off a little to the right, lowering terrain, there's less houses over there. I know it is IMC stuff out there today, but that's what I plan on doing. And depending on my height, we'll go zero degrees, get best glide, and then 85, 80, full flaps, masters off, crack my door. Even though he's been flying here for seven years, he still takes about 30 seconds to review the takeoff emergencies. He needs to be at 50 knots by a certain taxiway or he's going to abort the takeoff. And if he has an engine failure on takeoff, he knows exactly what he's going to do. And if you notice, he was chair flying the entire procedure. This is a really good habit because it helps build muscle memory. And that way, if your engine fails and you're in the weather, then you know exactly what to do instead of panicking because you haven't reviewed these procedures in a while. Ignition, inlet, and lights are done. Harnesses are done. 20 degrees as always, so 1390 on the torque. November Tango Zulu ready for departure. And November Tango Zulu report traffic in the zone. Runway 17 left, make a left turn, good for takeoff. 17 left, left turn, clear for takeoff. November Tango Zulu. Ignition condition, flaps 20, fuel and harnesses. Checklist is complete, rotate 64. He said checklist complete. And one of the first things I noticed about Ryan's videos is that he's not using a paper checklist and the aircraft doesn't have an electronic checklist. I know there are a lot of pilots out there that don't like to use a paper checklist and maybe you've gotten to a point where you have it all memorized. The only problem with that is that all it takes is one small distraction and then your mind convinces you that you've already done something on the checklist when maybe you haven't. That's why Ryan uses this black box. And as we watch his departure and see how bad the weather is, I wanna be clear that Ryan did not ask me to make this video and he didn't ask me to talk about this black box either. I asked him if I could share it with everyone because if you don't like to use a checklist, I'd rather you use this than nothing, especially since it could save your life. It's called the buddy checkbox and it's essentially a visual representation of the most critical items in your checklist. Now, when you move all the switches up, that means you're cleared for takeoff. And when all the switches are down, then you're cleared to land. And the best part about this is that it works in any aircraft because there's no wiring. It uses Velcro to stay in place and it's backlit for night flying too. Now, in my honest opinion, if all this box did was save you from taking off one time with the flaps in the wrong position, or maybe it prevented you from landing gear up, then it would definitely be worth it. And if you want to support my channel and support Ryan, then use the link in the comments or the video description below to go to buddycheckbox.com to learn more about it and get yours today. For right now, as you can see from the footage, the weather is a lot worse than what Ryan had hoped for, and now he's got to come up with a plan. Well, I have my instrument reserves today which is basically, I get back to Garoga with an hour and a half of fuel. So if I cannot land out here, and I don't have any other place like Samogu or something like that, that I can go touch down and just sit it out. And basically at that point, I'm coming back this direction. If they say it's no good, then I'm going to Medang immediately because I don't have any other options at that point. This is a great example of smart fuel planning, and he was already prepared for this before he took off. If he can't land at Narambi, and if he can't go back to Garoka, where he just took off from, then he has enough fuel to go to Medang, which is another airfield where he knows the weather is clear. Something else that's worth pointing out is even though Ryan is flying in the weather, air traffic control in Papua New Guinea is more like an advisory service. The controller will let him know if there are other aircraft around him, but it's up to Ryan to decide what altitude to fly at and where to go so he doesn't crash into the mountains. Obviously, at some point, Ryan needs to descend, and he's hoping that the weather clears up. But if he doesn't, then here's his plan to get below the weather. You can see this lighter area right here. 
that's a big valley, so I'm kind of hoping and expecting that some clouds are going to start breaking up up there so I can make a quick descent, just like this little line shows, basically right around that little mountain and then up the valley. So this is a huge kind of horseshoe-shaped valley, can't really tell. Um, worst case scenario is I'm going to have to drop down out into this area here, which is just lowlands. They go all the way down to basically sea level. Uh, 100 feet is the deck out there. So basically I can just head out that way, start my descent, even if it is IMC because there is no mountains out there. I think this is another smart decision. And the best part about this is that he's doing all of this right now while he's got the autopilot on at cruise altitude. He's trying to plan ahead as much as possible. So that way when he's dealing with the stress of trying to get down below the weather and find the airfield, he's got less to think about. And that brings us to the approach. I'm seeing visual here, not amazing, but enough to where I am going down. Looks like that's the ridge going into the Sambari Valley. That actually looks even better option right here, so I'm going this way. Put it on the big map, tr throw terrain on. That way I have a lot better visual representation of what I'm looking at here. All right, this is actually looking really good. I'm looking to see where Narambi is, though. Around this hill, I believe. This little hill right here with those clouds. A little hill right there. It should just be right on the other side of that. You need to keep in mind that Ryan has been flying these same routes for seven years now. So he is very familiar with the terrain and he knows where all the mountains are and he knows how to get in and out of these airfields. Even still, he's looking outside and confirming that the ridge line that he sees matches the terrain displayed in his aircraft, so he has a full awareness of where he's going at all times. And I'm sure if this was Ryan's first time flying into Narambi, he probably wouldn't be doing this right now. He knows that he's taking some risk, but it's a very measured approach to risk based on his experience and the use of the aircraft systems to help keep him safe. Could be right up this valley here. Oh, that's not looking good. <laughs> that's not looking good at all. I don't even see Narambi at this point. It's up in those clouds, and man, once it gets cloudy like that, 20 degrees of flaps. I'm gonna go up this way here and make a left or right-hand turn out of the valley. That way I can see off my left, and then uh, this is gonna feel a little more comfortable coming up this way and coming around. This is exactly what I've talked about in every single video I've made where a pilot crashed trying to fly up a canyon or a valley. Ryan handled the situation perfectly. You always need to leave yourself a way out. And Ryan knows that if he flies up the left side of the valley, then he can get closer to where the airfield is, and that gives him enough room to make a right-hand turn to turn back around. I'm uh, basically 500 feet above the runway at this point. I don't even see the runway. Like, at all, at all. That's why I have these OBS, so I can kind of get a visual picture. All right, well, 400. Oh, man, I don't see anything up there. It's 100% locked in now. The question we're left with is what does he do now? You might not have noticed it, but when Ryan was turning up the valley, you could see another airfield. Now, Ryan hadn't talked about this airfield the entire flight, and my guess is probably because he figured these two airfields are so close together that if the weather was bad at Narambi, then it was also going to be bad at this other field. And he really didn't expect this, but he does a great job of adjusting the plan, and he decides to land here, and that way he can save fuel, and he can also watch the weather and take off the moment things are clear. This is just a really cool approach to watch. And if there's only one lesson you learn from this entire video, it's that Ryan was okay with failing his mission of picking up the passengers on this flight. You have to ask yourself, is it worth it? And even though Ryan might have failed, he managed the risk and he landed safely and he lived to get the passengers on the next flight. Overall, I think Ryan's videos offer a lot of great lessons, especially when it comes to flying in the mountains. And if you want to support both of our channels, then go to buddycheckbox.com and get one of these because this box could save your life. And if you want to see another example of a YouTube pilot that did everything right and handled an interesting emergency, then check out this video on the screen here. And thank you so much for your support.